So welcome. Happy to be here with all of you. I'm going to get started because we've got a lot to cover, not to increase your anxiety or anything. <laughs> so let's take a moment, and I'll invite you to close the eyes. For some of you, that might be difficult, and so that's why it's an invitation. It's not a requirement. If you're uncomfortable doing that, you can look down or uh, do whatever you want. Look up, down, wherever you want. Just don't look at me. Okay, and so I'll invite you to close the eyes, take a breath in, hold the breath at the top, and then exhale all the way. One more time, breathing in, holding at the top, and notice, just notice how it feels to hold the breath, and then exhale all the way. Good. Last time, we're going to breathe in. Hold, and this time when you exhale, see if you can notice where you might feel tension in the body, the head, the shoulders, the belly, the legs, the knees, and let go. Good. So today's magical word is noticing. That's the magical word. So when you're ready, you can open the eyes, and I'll invite you to just notice, and I'm going to notice how I'm standing in front of the projector a lot. Um, hi, welcome. Uh, come on in, there's some chairs here. So I'll invite you to notice not only what I'm talking about today, but also notice your own reactions to it. Notice your memories. Notice where your mind goes to the present future. Um, oh, some more chairs are coming. Good. We're in, we're in luck. So my name is Martin Blank. Today's session is called Tackle Anxiety and Stress, Tools for Resilient Classrooms and Schools. Um, I, I'm a former educator and, and administrator. Well, I, I guess I still am educating. Uh, I, was t I taught fourth grade in high school. I, taught, um, I was an administrator in Philly as a school climate manager. I also am a registered yoga teacher, a breathwork instructor. I have a master's in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Raise your hand if you've heard of positive psychology. Yes. Oh, awesome. Yes. So positive psych, it's not that the rest of psychology is negative. No, that's not what we're saying. But there's traditional psychology, traditional um, ways of addressing problems are to view them and try to fix them, right? Remove the negative. That's what traditional psychology says. It's let's Let's get people to function. Let's fix depression. Let's fix anxiety. Let's fix mental illness. Positive psych says, well, is that all there is to life? Is functioning? Or is there more? Is there also thriving? So it really takes seriously as a subject matter things like optimism, resilience, gratitude, grit, um, serenity, positive emotion, engagement, flow, positive relationships. Um, you know, accomplishment, achievement, the ideal life, so to speak. So, um, welcome. Come on in. So, it can be applied, positive sight can be applied to schools, uh, to relationships, to your own life. All it really is, if you want to boil it down, is saying, let's look at not only what you can take away from a situation, but what can you add, right? It's not only about taking away the bad. We can also look at adding good. So today in this workshop, we're going to get to um, look at, you know, answer these questions. Why are you anxious? Not you in specific, but you as like the greater us you, I guess. That's a weird way to say it. Refine your skills in managing difficult emotions and people. I'm going to try to lead a session without increasing your stress, hopefully. And then get you ready to be an expert in emotionally intelligent leadership and education. So just to get a sense. Teachers in the room, hands up, yeah, leaders, uh, administrators, we're all leaders, but admin, yeah, counselors, awesome. Anyone else that's, yeah, social workers, consultants, okay, great. Uh, parents, any parents in the room? Yes, okay, cool. I just joined the club recently, so I have to ask, because it makes me feel cool. Thank you, yeah, he's 15 months, so still kind of recent. Yeah, I know. So this is our agenda. We're going to start by complaining, okay? 
And the reason we are gonna, we're going to complain, well, I'll tell you the reason in a moment. I'll go more into depth. But there's this thing going around. Um, that it's called toxic positivity. Anyone come across it before? Yeah, anyone can describe what, what is toxic positivity? Yeah, fake happy, Pollyanna, right? It's like painting a smile on your face. What does that ultimately do? That actually has really detrimental health impacts on you. If you pretend to be happy and you just paint, it's different than like fake it till you make it. Because if you fake it till you make it and you really, really try to embody everything that it means to be happy, but if you're, it's different. It's like channeling the negative and bringing out positive is different than rejecting the negative, right? And so. We don't want to just push negative away. We, in that, that's what I mean by toxic positive. So we'll complain. Uh, we'll, we'll also, I'm going to also ask you what you want to get out of this session. Hopefully, I'm going to get a way to download all of your brains in 30 seconds to answer that question. We're going to look at why self-care sucks. Uh, we're also going to, uh, to do a quick intro uh, to this, but it's not going to be at the beginning for some reason. Uh, I'm a jazz musician. That's why I throw things around a lot. We're going to look at three. Uh, main, uh, I guess you can call them tools, in, uh, noticing, breathing, and communication. I also work with, I didn't mention this, but I work with schools and school districts in helping them create uh, systems to bring, out, bring down anxiety, bring down burnout, increase teacher retention. Uh, and when, there's, you know, when you can't pay teachers a million dollars a year, which is what they deserve, uh, you have to do other things in order to make them happy to stay. Right? And you're seeing now a tremendous exodus from the teaching profession. So all of a sudden, my phone's ringing. Oh, like my teachers are quitting, and it's costing us $50,000 every time we need a turnover. Maybe you can help us out. And so um, that's the kind of stuff I do. If you're interested in talking, just let me know. Uh, so we're going to look at also uh, uncovering the true causes of anxiety and communication. I know this is a tall order for a, literally a 40-minute session, but uh, I have faith. Time just kind of slows down. OK, so time to complain. All right, so I, what I want you to do is, with your partner next to you, you're going to find a partner, just two people, all right? No threes, just twos. And partner A, whoever you are, you're going to complain about anything, any type of complaint. And I know some of you are like super positive. You've never complained before. The way to do it is you just like dig down. You're like, what is like bad? What is bad? And then you can just share. It can be really serious things. It can be not serious. It can be stupid. It can be, for example, like I complained that this column, beautiful column, doesn't have an outlet. That's my complaint about this column. That's an example, all right? And so you'll go on for about, I don't know, a little bit. And then I'll tell you to switch. All right, ready? And don't switch till I tell you. All right, ready? Partner A, begin. That's a good complaint. Keep it coming. Okay, 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 okay. People are. People are having way, way too much fun for a complaining session. Um, okay, now partner B, you're going to start. But this time, partner A, I don't want you to say anything to partner B. I want you to just like non-verbally encourage them. Uh-huh, right? Like help them keep going without saying anything. All right, go, switch. Well.
Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Okay. All right. All right. Shh, 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 shh. All right. Good. Good. All right. Okay, everybody. All right. Bring it back. Bring it back. Good. Wow. Y'all could have kept going for a while. Y'all, I... You know, I usually do the complaint sessions for a longer time. Since this is a compressed session, there's a lot to do. I had to cut you off. But that doesn't mean that you can't find your complaint partner after the session <laughs> and keep going. That doesn't mean, OK? So just remember who they are. Some of you know each other quite well. So what, how was that? How was the complaint session? It was fun. That's weird. Was it not fun for anyone? Was it kind of boring or not uncomfortable or something? Yeah. It was a little awkward because you didn't know how personal you could oh, get, but yeah. you wanted to still fulfill the assignment. Yeah, OK. So, so somebody, you didn't know how personal you could get, but you still wanted to, to fulfill the assignment, she said. Good. And uh, what was fun about it for those of you who said it was good? Yes, in the back. Oh. Freedom. Just let it out. You're never going to see them again. Good. OK. Uh, yes? Even though we didn't know each other, our complaints were relatable. Yeah, they were relatable. Anybody found uh, relatable complaints? Good. Yeah. I think we know each other pretty well. Yeah. We learned a lot about her. OK. Yeah. Good. And what about your partner? Um, how was it for you? You usually keep it bottled in. How was it this time? Release and cathartic, I heard over here. Yes, good. Anybody? So let's do a little survey. Uh, 10 being amazing and 0 being I want to leave right now. Uh, 10, uh, raise your hand if it was like, let's just, let's just hold up your fingers. Of, of, and I'm going to do an average real quick. Um, oh my gosh, OK. All right, I'm getting an average. I'm seeing a lot of 8s and 9s. I'm seeing a lot of 8s and 9s, some 7s. Good, awesome. So what I call this, I call this scheduled complaining. And you can schedule complaining every, either every day, twice a day, once a week. Um, you could do it with your staff meetings. You could do it with your spouse. Um, what's really cool is the, uh, the person that you're complaining to is prepared. They're ready to hear you complain, so they're fully there. And there's a difference between this and what we normally do. How's your energy level now compared to when you started? Is it higher? Yes. How's your energy level after somebody complains at you for an hour nonstop and you don't know when they're going to stop? Down, right? So negativity complaint pulls our energy down, but when we create a container around it, when there's rules, there's an understanding, there's a social understanding that that's what we're doing, it can be really, really healthy. And so this is venting. You may have come across that word, right? Schedule complaining. So there's your first strategy, OK? All right, good. So now let me just get, I'm going to take it from three people, what you want to get out of this session. So you know the title of the session. We looked at objectives. And I do this before each session, not because I'm going to abandon my entire agenda, but because I want to make sure to touch on things that actually matter to people and the types of examples that I'm going to give are related. And so what I'm doing here also in asking you this question is definitely something I'd encourage folks to do when you lead meetings. Start with this question. What do you want to get out of this? In that way, they can't give you a negative evaluation. <laughs> they can't, because you gave them what they wanted. And if they do, and they, but make sure you tell them if they do give you a negative evaluation to write it in pencil so you can erase it <laughs> at the end before you show your supervisor. No, I'm just kidding. OK, so what do you want to get out of today? Anybody? Yeah. Strategies to help adults in the building. OK, raise your hand if you agree, if, if that's something important for you. Good, awesome. Anything else? Yes? Uh, strategies for high anxiety elementary kids. High anxiety elementary kids. Good, raise your hand if, if you agree. Yes, good. Anyone else? Yeah? Anxiety of the kids not liking to school. Yeah, anxiety for like, kids that don't want to come into the building. Yes? 
Agreeing, good. Agreeing with that? Yes. Anything else for different or not in those general buckets? High at risk students and behavior problem students. Yeah. Okay, high at risk and behavior problem. Behavior is, we'll look at that in a moment. It's communication for sure. Yeah, in the back, in the, in the yellow. Finding the time to fill your own. Finding time to fill your own. Thank you for mentioning yourself. Okay, everybody here, and it's not, it's not, it's not uh, a surprise. Educators are, are probably very altruistic compared to many professions. And so the first five responses I got from you were about other people, right? This was the first time somebody said filling your own cup. It's so important. And the question, this is why I said why self-care training, why, why self-care sucks. It, it doesn't really suck, but usually self-care trainings are like, oh my gosh, right? Like what is it about self-care trainings that I'm just going to, that, that, yeah, so why do self-care training suck? Well, we talked about uh, toxic positivity. Somebody tell me in your mind, like, what's a thought that comes into your head when your supervisor says, all right, we're going to do a self-care training this next month. That's going to be our PD. Yes? I have so many other things to do. I have so many other things to do. What else? They seem like, like they go against each other. Self-care training is like, mm. <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. So you've associated self, you've associated trainings with stress and annoying, I don't know why you're here, but no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, so thank you for sharing. Yeah. They just want an excuse to give me more work. An excuse to give me more work. Yeah. Checkbox. So they can tell their superintendent, oh, we did, we did our self-care. Checkbox. We care about your well-being. Checkbox. Meanwhile, email later on is saying, thank you for joining us for self-care training. Here's a whole bunch of other stuff to do, mm -hmm. right? I was going to say crap, but it didn't feel like so appropriate. So anyway, so here's a, what was that? <laughs> Be my authentic self. Oh, can you guys handle it? Can you handle Okay. All right. Good. Um, thank you. I'm just going to let it out. So thank you for the encouragement. All right, all right, all right. You asked for it, okay? All right. So, so right, and then and then there's a and then there's like an even deeper level, which is like, do the people that are in the self care training even feel like they're worthy of taking care of themselves? Right? Like that. Nobody's talking about that. Like before you give people rattle off a list of you can go running. You can take an afternoon walk. You can do yoga. Have you thought of that? Have you th <laughs> has anybody thought of doing yoga? Like, uh, it's not new. It's like, I don't need you to give me a list of things I could do or I should do. I don't need a should on myself anymore, right? <laughs> what I really need is like, what I really need is actual like self-introspection in time and in, in value so that I don't feel like coming to the training was a waste of time. It needs to be valuable. So that's the first question. So we, when, we're, when we're doing this stuff, there is a way to make self-care matter, but it's about having those real, real conversations. And the last thing is they ignore. So you're, you're saying self-care, you've got to take care of yourself. But meantime, at the, at the same time, I'm not going to do anything systemically that's going to reduce your stress. The system's going to stay the same. You just have to be more resilient. Right? It's your job to be more resilient. I'm not going to do it. Right? It's, if you can't handle it, it's your problem. You don't have enough skills. And then they're like, they go online and look at a job in like Google. And they go to work for Google where Google gives them like free food and like all this cool stuff. You're like, oh, I wonder why they left. Right? OK. So here's this very cute animal saying, Psst, you don't need more strategies. Give someone a strategy, they say that they, they'll say, I don't have time to practice it. I value many of you who came here and said, we want strategies. It's really about helping people cultivate the mental and emotional state for, for them to make their own strategies. Like if you create a dynamic when people, where people are not in fight or flight, 
when people are regularly in rest and digest, parasympathetic, calm states, then they come up with their own strategies. That's where creativity lives. So that's like if there's one thing you take out it's, of today, it's like, all right, let me just focus on um, helping people create that state where creativity happens. But don't worry, you strategy seekers, we're still going to do some. OK, does this f sound familiar? Teachers are saying they need more time. Raise your hand. Yes. Uh, teachers aren't getting paid enough. Raise your hand. Yes. Teachers are leaving schools. Raise your hand. Yes. Students are not connecting with teachers. Raise your hand. Students and teachers are experiencing high levels of burnout and stress. Motivation levels are the lowest they've ever been. Schedule's always changing. Over, I'm feeling overworked and overwhelmed. Students are very impulsive. Yes, 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 yes. I survey so many people, so many schools, and these are like the top things I'm hearing over and over again. And I have to pretend like I'm surprised. I have to pretend like, oh my gosh, really? Like your teachers are burnt out? <clears throat> really? OK, well, so what can we do about it? Well, let's look. Let's, well, so all that leads to stress. So what's the recipe to, for stress soup? Anybody a good chef in here? We got any good cooks? What do you make if somebody asks you to, they want a nice big bowl of stress soup? What would you put in it? What ingredients do you put in it? You put a lot of what? What? OK, responsibilities. So demands. We'll call those demands, all right? Can we, can we do that? Demands. Heap of demands. We'll take one big heap of demands. What else goes in the soup? Sorry, sorry. Too many students. So that so demand. We'll we'll put that under demands. That's an example. What? Not enough time. What is time? Time is a resource, right? So so heap of demands. Not enough resources. What's another example of a resource? We got time. What else we got? Money. Money. Definitely money helps bring down stress. Health is a is a re, I, I would call that maybe a oh help. Yes, help. Good. So other people. Yes. Unpredictability is what? A demand. Okay. So let's just say, let's add that as a condition. Let's add that under demands, right? Because you, you have to handle that. But that's a, good, that's a good one. Okay, good. So time, money. What else? Nobody has said the third real big resource that we can tap into. Yeah. Who said that? Ding, 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 ding. So where do you get your energy? Because can you add more time? No. Well, maybe. That would be really cool. <laughs> but no, you can't add more time. Can you, can you add more money? Yeah, but it's going to require energy and time. So let's not look at money for a moment. What can you add in, instantly? Starbucks. Energy. Caffeine. What was that? Starbucks, caffeine. Star OK, good. So that's where you get your energy, Starbucks. It's like, yeah, I guess. Where, where else do you get energy from? Sleep, where else? Friends, family. Friends, positive friends or negative friends? I mean, positive. Positive, uplifting, yes. Where else? Where else do you get energy from? Motivation. 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 You're all doing it right now. Nobody's saying it. Are you resting? Resting? You're not, yeah, I guess you're resting. What are you doing right now? What do you do 25,000 times a day? Breathe. breathe in and breathe out. Right? You breathe in and out. If you didn't, if you didn't breathe for a moment, you would die, right? So I taught, I, I taught um, 15,000 people in the span of three years just about how to cap, like, use your breath to increase your energy, right? And so I remember going to classes with, with students, and they'd say, I already know how to breathe. Like, why are you here? I already know how to breathe. What do you mean you teach breathing? Somebody said, breathing is booty ass. Like, I had never, <laughs> I had never heard I had never heard that expression, but whatever, right? I was like, OK, great. I'll add that one to my lexicon. So yeah, so I, so I had to explain to them, like, all right, well, you can breathe like you're like barely alive, or you can breathe like you're happy to be alive. You can literally change your breath, change your breath, change your state of energy, right? And this is a. You know, it's not the first time I, I dropped in a, uh, I dropped into a, a, a session earlier. Let me look at this. I dropped, you know, so breathing is so 2021. 20, yeah. So there's, every emotion corresponds with a breathing rhythm. 
they, they've done studies on this. They hook people up, they, they show them images that make them feel certain ways, and their breathing changes depending on the emotion. So you breathe like you're calm, you're going to feel calm. You look at something that influences you to be calm, you'll breathe like you're calm, right? It's a, it's a cycle. And then you change the breath pattern. You can, it, you can induce anxiety in someone by changing the way they breathe. Not that you'd ever want to do that. But it's really important because we're leading people in breathing practices as educators, hopefully. Yes? Raise your hand if you've led some breathing practices. OK, not enough. I want all of you. You don't have to be a certified breathwork instructor to do it. I'll show you a really simple way. Usually, how long is the breath cycle? How many seconds? Inhale and exhale. How many seconds? Three to five. Three to five seconds. Do it 25,000 times a day. OK? What you want to do now is, in order to improve resilience, bring down fight or flight, activate the prefrontal cortex, get ready for learning, positivity. You want to extend the cycle to 10 seconds. OK, six times a minute is like great. It's a great place to be, breathing six times a minute. So that can be six in, four out, probably more like four in, six out. OK, let's try it. OK, ready? All right, we're going to do four in, six out. I'll invite you to close the eyes. You don't have to, cause, just because it's weird if you look at me. OK, so I'm, I'm going to have my eyes closed. That's why. So breathing in for four, two, three, four. Hold for a moment, and then breathe out, two, through the nose, three, four, five, six. Hold, breathe in, two, three, four. Hold, breathe out, two, Three, four, five, six. Hold. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Out. Two, three, four, five, six. Hold. Breathe in. Count on your own. Hold. Breathe out for six. Hold. And relax. Come back to normal breathing. Good. Awesome. Open the eyes when you're ready. How's everyone doing? Good. Ready for a nap? Anyone? OK, good. Anybody have trouble going to sleep at night? Yeah? Well, you can try this out. Try it out. So it's 10, 10 seconds. Good. Any questions? Any, any thoughts? Any shares? It's really important when you do this with kids, when you do this with teachers, always have a little bit of time reserved for a debrief at the end. Why is that so important to debrief? Actually, I didn't even debrief with you, so you were going to debrief. Question. Yeah. Blowing out of your nose instead of Yeah. Out through the mouth, out through the nose. It's different, right? You have to check in with yourself, see how, what feels better. I prefer breathing out through the nose. If I'm really, really stressed and I need to like let go of a lot, then I'll breathe out through the mouth. I can do it through like a little straw, or I can do it through like, you know, just don't be in front of anyone when you do that. Yeah. It seems to me that I've heard a lot of kids say, like, breathing doesn't work. My yeah. therapist told me to breathe. Yeah. It doesn't work. Don't tell me that. Yeah. Yeah, so raise your hand if you've ever been super angry. And somebody says, just take a breath, dude. And then you slap him across the face, <laughs> like Will Smith. Right? So what is it about somebody telling you to breathe when you're super angry that's infuriating? I'm not saying the student was super angry. Yeah. It seems dismissive. It seems dismissive, right? The student isn't there yet. You know the ang acting out cycle? It's like trigger, activation, like aggravation, peak, recovery then, re then uh, reflect. That, the reflect, you don't want to teach somebody to breathe when they're drowning. You don't want to teach someone to swim, I mean, when they're drowning. <laughs> that's, that's what I meant. OK? So it's really important for in moments of calm. Every, the, the, the problem is we get into, like, we don't do the preparation when things are calm. And then in the middle of crisis, we're like, oh my gosh, oh my, everybody breathe, everybody breathe. And nobody's like learned the skill of tapping in and, and coming into their parasympathetic rest and digest state. It's a practice. It's like literally like a switch that we have to practice 
Like, okay, now engage, 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 right? And so part of that is learning how to be responsive rather than reactive, right? So, what's, so, that's what we'll, so we looked at breathing. We're going to look at noticing, okay? Noticing is a skill, okay? Noticing is important in order to respond. What's the difference between responding and reacting? Yeah. You're what? Taking in? Yeah. Good. Good. You notice. You take the time to notice what's happening, and then you make a decision about whatever it is you need to do. Okay? So yeah, there's impulsivity and we, we heard that. Responding is thoughtful. You're considering pros and cons. Reacting is impulse without thinking. Don't consider. So we obviously want to help people move towards it. Is reacting bad? No. no we don't, we, we want to get away from saying, this is bad and this is good. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. No. The question is, what makes you more powerful? So you talk to a group of fourth graders, and you're like, what makes you more powerful? Reacting and giving your, giving your, your power away or responding? And so how, once you have that, now you have your why. Well, I want to be a powerful person. So now, OK, so let's figure out a way to respond. And so noticing is a muscle. So mindful, we're not going to get into super long discussion on mindfulness because we have literally negative five minutes. But <laughs> mindfulness is the awareness that arises. I'm, folks have heard of this definition, John Kabat-Zinn. Mindfulness is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. It can literally be about anything. And we've gotten worse at noticing. People have gotten worse at no. If you can't notice what's happening, then how can you be responsive? If you don't notice how you're feeling, if you don't notice what's happening around you, if you don't notice what, you, what thoughts you're having. So this is literally a different quality of awareness. In school, we're really good about teaching how to be aware of the external world. Science teaches us about the external world. Social studies history teaches us about people that happened, things that happened a long time ago, things that are happening externally. Math is about whatever we're looking at externally. English, my, I mean, literature, it's about a book. It's external. Mindfulness is about becoming aware eventually of what's happening internally. And, and a lot of us don't have practice doing that. So even just setting aside like a minute and just noticing, getting good at building the noticing muscle. Like that's literally what it is. Like, I don't know if anybody has students that, like, somebody says somewhat, something, and before you, like, can turn around, somebody already hit somebody in the face. Or, like, boom. Pfft. It's like we see that we saw it in, uh, at the Oscars. It's like, it's like the thing to do, right? It's like there's no reflection, no time. No t Literally, mindfulness is separating, prying apart the stimulus from the reaction. Prying it apart because usually they're, they're glued together. It's like, she called me an idiot. Pfft. Give me back my toy. Pfft. Like, no, no, wait a second. If you pry it apart, you see, OK, well, she said you were an idiot. OK, how do you feel when that happens? What choices do you have? What would you like to do? It's like, boom, prying it apart. But that conversation can't happen if the mind is so used to the reactive, is so used to reacting. And so it's really good to be intentional build in intentional practices where we're just practicing noticing. So let's do it. We're going to do the world's shortest mindfulness exercise because, again, we have negative seven minutes now left together. So I'll invite you to close the eyes for a moment. Again, invitation. And just notice. We're going to, we're going to notice first the sounds in the environment. And you're not resisting the sounds. You're just noticing them. Noticing the sound of the air, noticing the sound of people laughing, noticing the, the sound of the vent, the sound of my voice, sound of people moving. Just the sounds. And now moving that same gentle quality of awareness, moving it now to your body, starting at the top of the head and just gently scanning all the way down to the feet. And maybe that'll bring up emotions for you, but just bringing back the awareness of the body. Now notice the breath coming in through the nose and then into the lungs, 
and then exhaling without you having to do anything. You do this 25,000 times a day, just noticing, again, noticing the fact that you're breathing. And now notice the thoughts that you're having. Notice maybe you're planning ahead, remembering, maybe you're judging, maybe you're getting down on yourself, maybe you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or how you hated lunch or whatever. You're noticing your thoughts. Just notice them, but from 30,000 feet. You're not in them. You're seeing them. There's a big difference. You're not going down the rabbit hole of thoughts. You're just noticing them. Oh, that's interesting. I'm planning. Good, and now gently noticing, moving the awareness to your emotions. Any emotions, maybe you're feeling anxious, calm, upset, happy, whatever you're noticing. Impatient. And just give it little names like that, whatever you're feeling. And good, now bringing the awareness back to the room, back to the sounds, the sound of my voice, and back to the room. Good. Open the eyes when you're ready. How was that? Was that restful for people? Why was that restful? We didn't, I didn't tell you to rest. I didn't tell you to relax. I didn't tell you to go to sleep. What was restful about that? Yeah. 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 So it's kind of like grounding. Yeah, grounding. Grounding, just bringing your mind to the present moment. It, like I heard... Um, the guy who was at the main stage, I don't know his name, he was talking about self-regulation. It's exhausting to be in the future, in the past, planning, worrying, judging, criticizing, analyzing, everything except noticing. So when we come back to noticing, it's, it's like so refreshing. It's like, oh my gosh, this is actually my life right now. My good friend Corey Mascara just wrote a book called Stop Missing Your Life. And that's what it's about. It's like just we spend our entire lives in the past or in the future. So this, these are examples of things we can sort of help our kids do. So um, another question I have for you um, is can we use cognitive behavioral therapy in, in, if you're not a trained psychologist? Yes. Good news. Well, well in a way, right? You're not going to sit with somebody and diagnose them. But what you can do is bring in CBT into the classroom. What do I mean by that? Well, what causes, what causes anxiety? Let's start there. What causes somebody to be anxious? If I say, you have a test coming up on Friday, what causes anxiety? Fears associated with that. Pre fear of failure, thoughts, expectations, Interpretations, yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Unpredictability, yes. So not having, not having, but but I can tell you, it's very predictable. You're gonna have a test on Friday. You still feel anxious. Right. Okay. So what's gonna be on it? Not knowing. Yeah. Not having confidence. Good. So CBT kind of helps us, and we can we can sort of uh, use some of the tools from it. What CBT is, um, the, some core principles are that feelings are not directly caused by triggers. So I want people to stop saying, you made me feel X. Nobody made you feel anything. If you ever hear a kid say that, say, uh, just slight correction, and then they'll slap you. OK, but <laughs> real quick, feelings are caused by our interpretation of triggers. Right? So somebody said something. So, by the way, I'm happy to send these slides to people. Just leave me your email, and then I won't spam you. I'll just send you the slide. <laughs> Conscious or unconscious beliefs or, in, in, or, of, or interpretations of triggers cause feelings. By observing what we're making something mean, we have ownership over the way we feel in relation to the event. Okay? So, somebody says, you want to ask somebody out on a date, and, and it causes you a lot of anxiety. But there's something in between. There's a belief. So there's an activating event, and then there's a belief, then there's a consequence. So the event is you, you, th you think about asking somebody to hang out. Your belief is, I'm not worthy of hanging out. Therefore, the consequence is you'll feel anxious. Consequence is you'll feel. So the event is not causing, 
the anxiety. The belief about the event is causing the anxiety. So it's really cool. How do we operationalize this? Well, something called um, ABCDE. <laughs> Activating event, belief, consequence. Dispute the belief, new, event, new effect, OK? So um, let's give an example. I don't know. Um, somebody gave me a really good example the other day. Oh, my gosh. This is the time to remember it, isn't it? Um, it was so good. Oh, yeah. OK, she was working with a kindergartner. And the kindergartner is crying. Why? Because nobody asked him to play with him. So the, the teacher said, why are you crying? He's like, because I have no friends. And so, he, and so what was he doing? The event is nobody asked him to play with him. The belief is, I have no friends. Therefore, he feels sad. So then she helped him dispute the belief. Well, let's look at that. Do you actually have no friends, or did somebody just not ask you to play with them? Let's look at the grand scheme of things. Because we tend to fall into mental traps. And then the effect, of course, was he felt better. So, but mental traps, you can't see this. I'm sorry. But again, if you give me your email, right? I do it on purpose. I make it so small. So you have to give me your email, so then I'll send it to you. No, really, though. Our thinking trap is jumping to conclusions. A lot of us do this. Mind reading, personalizing, externalizing, overgeneralizing, all or nothing thinking. These are common things that we do all the time. And this is the cause of our anxiety. We create our own anxiety by interpreting the events of our life. And we've learned to do this. Not to say that there aren't actual things that happen that are pretty universally anxiety provoking, like abuse, for example. This is not about telling people to deal with abuse, change your way of thinking about it. Just, you know, this is a way of saying 99.9% .9 of the things that are happening that are causing us anxiety are, are within our control. By just, by just observing what mental trap, what thinking trap am I falling into? And there's all this science behind this. I tend to fall into um, attributing the cause of a situation to one's own characteristics or actions, personalizing. Somebody didn't write back to my email, a proposal I sent. Right? It's been a week. Oh, they think, they think my prices are too high. Or they think I'm, I'm uh, not qualified enough. And then I get the email back, oh, hey, I was just on vacation. How are you? I'm like, oh, I just caused myself anxiety for literally a week and a half. And this person was on the beach in, like, Mexico having coconut water. Like, that's the level of, like, that's my thinking trap. I, I personalize. So it's really, really good to start getting training on. This is an example of a, of a sort of a worksheet to help people go through this. You know, what happened? What thought or belief did you have about what happened? What did you do or feel? What else could you have thought? How could you change this belief? Um, good. So we have three minutes left. So um, I'll just share one more thing with you. And this is about communicating, OK? This is about calm-inducing communication. This is, was actually the last thing I was going to share. So everything we've done is about creating our own internal resilience, this is about not making other people more anxious. Raise your hand if anybody's ever gotten defensive when you talk to them or when you give them a, f a piece of feedback. Why? Because you said, you're annoying. You said, you're annoying, or you said, you're an idiot, and so they got defensive, or some variation of that. So a really, really great strategy is nonviolent communication. You start with observing. I notice you're standing really close to me. Right? Feel. I feel. I'm, I'm feeling a little frustrated. I'm not saying you're an idiot for standing close to me. I'm just saying I'm feeling frustrated. Need, I need space. Request, would you mind you know, just stepping back for a moment? Boom. If they, they can still get defensive, but the chances of them getting defensive drop substantially. Try this out with students. I notice you're typing your pencil on your desk. I feel a little bit annoyed when I see you do that. I need um, silence because I'm trying to teach everybody, and I want to make sure that so-and-so can hear me in the back. Request, would you mind not tapping your pencil till later? Or maybe we can have a drum, or, drum circle or whatever later on <laughs> during recess. Wow. Right? Yeah. And so how is, that's different than saying, stop doing that. What do you do? When you do that, you create a relationship when you do this. You create trust. You don't have defensiveness. It takes five seconds longer, yes, 
but then they won't keep doing it the next day and the next day and the next day because they see you as a person, they see you as vulnerable, they see you as human, you have feelings, you have needs, you're not just saying stop doing that, you're not just some random anonymous person saying to stop. So I want to sort of invite you to reflect today based on what we did. We looked at breathing practices, we looked at noticing as a noticing muscle, we looked at cognitive behavioral therapy and used the ABCDEs of CBT, There's, there you go, there's your acronym for today. And we also looked at one communication strategy that can be really useful in bringing down anxiety levels. So my question is, based on our conversation today, what actionable steps can you take to decrease anxiety, decrease stress, increase well-being, right? Two things you can take away, one thing you can add. You don't have to do all of these. You can start with one. Um, and that's, that's it. I, I guess, yeah, if you want to know more, just email me. I'm happy to talk. This is my LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you. This is my LinkedIn, um, and this is a brand new headshot, so um, you'll, find it, you'll find it on there. Thank you all so, so very much for everything you do every day. Thank you. And again, if you want the, the slide, a copy of the slides, oh, thank you. Copy of the slides, I have note cards here. I also have, perfect, that's perfect. Yes. Really appreciate, appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is like the crux of it, uh, helping, uh, helping our teachers. Thanks yes. Guys. Helping our teachers kind of be present. Yes. So they can hear what's going on, what they think I'm saying. Exactly. Saying. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Thank you. Thank I you. Definitely be I love this slide. How are you? Um, thank you. Enjoy. Enjoy the presentation. Here's some. Awesome. Oh, Just oh, yes, please. Happy. These are my cards. If anybody wants them, yes, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Email you to give us yes, slides? yes, email me. That's an even better idea. That would make my life easier. Oh, thank yeah, you. email me and I'll give you the slides. No, I still want your card. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I will send. I will send it to you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I know. I have to. I have to. It says. So this is your email. No. Oh, that's your web page. What's your, oh, there's your there's email. There's my email at the See, top. I can't see. It's so I know, I know. That was very funny and very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I have one? Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. I love your mask. What's thank you? I, I got picture one. give you? What's that? Hand, that, that um, if I scan that, what does that give you? That's my LinkedIn. Oh, that's your LinkedIn. Yes. Oh. I double. Oh, do you have a card? Yeah. Wow. Is it all plastic? Thank you. Or do you have any glass stuff? So we have some glass stuff.